The Islamic conquests were some of the quickest and most extensive in history, but even the Muslim armies did not penetrate into the vast expanse of steppe and forest of modern Russia. Numerous alien cultures, traditions and weather patterns dominated these lands and would have to be confronted when, one day in the early 10th century, a strange embassy arrived at Abbasid-ruled Baghdad. Welcome to our video on Ibn Fadlan, the Arab explorer who ventured north to the icy cold land of darkness. Your continued support allows us to expand our work and we are so grateful for that. We are always eager to create more videos for you and we think that you will enjoy our documentaries on post-World War II history over on the Cold War channel and our Wizards and Warriors channel that focuses on the fantasy and sci-fi lore battle documentaries. Links to both are in the description and pinned comment. Thanks for being with us. The year is 921 AD, 309 in the Islamic calendar. Baghdad is one of the most magnificent cities ever to exist, rivaling Byzantium's great imperial capital of Constantinople in the west. It is the pinnacle of scholarly achievement in the early Middle Ages, and a vast cradle of commerce and trade, wealthy beyond belief. However, its rulers, the Abbasid Caliphs, Sunni Islam's ruling clan since 750, are beginning to lose direct political control over much of their vast empire to local dynasts. From mysterious lands far to the north, an embassy arrived at the court of Caliph al muqtadir bearing three requests from Almish, king of the Volga Bulgars. Almish and his tribes had recently converted to Islam and desired the Caliph's patronage. His three requests were for experts in Islamic law to be sent so that the Bulgars could learn to worship properly, instruction on how to correctly build a mosque, and for funds with which Almish could construct a fort so that his lands could be protected from his Khazar enemies. Perhaps hoping to secure trade routes north, or eager to gain a powerful ally in Almish, al muqtadir graciously accepted and had his vizier put together an embassy comprising jurists, secretaries, emissaries and other representatives. One of them was Ahmad ibn Fadlan, a secretary to the Caliph's ambassador and expert in jurisprudence. Most importantly, he served as the narrator and chronicler of our tale. The Caliph's delegation set off from the City of Peace on June 21, 921. Unfortunately, because of the Khazar presence north of the Caucasus Mountains, they had to go the long way around. After leaving Iraq, Fadlan and the embassy travelled through the great cities of Iran and Khurasan, such as Hamadan, Rai, Nishapur and Merv, eventually arriving at Bukhara, seat of the Samanid Amirs, a Persian dynasty of former Zoroastrians. After being provided with everything they needed to survive, the emissaries were granted an audience with Nasser II, the 16-year-old Amir, who obeyed the Caliph's order to provide Turkic escort troops and to begin gathering Almish's promised 4,000 dinars. After spending a month at Bukhara, the party set sail down river on the Oxus with all haste, fearing the approach of a harsh winter. Crucially, this did not allow time for the funds earmarked for Almish to arrive, and the embassy entered Khwarezm empty-handed, winter storms slowing their progress the whole way. It eventually arrived at the settlement of Kath, where the Afrigid Shah Muhammad ibn Iraq ruled under Samanid suzerainty. After an initially warm welcome for the Caliph's men, the Shah's attitude soured, citing suspicion of a Turkic member of the embassy whom he suspected of selling weapons to his enemies. In addition, Muhammad did not want to allow Ibn Fadlan's party into nomadic pagan territory for fear of their death, stalling by saying he would have to personally ask his Samanid master for permission. After showing the letter of safe passage received from Nasser II, and doing a bit of strategic complaining, however, al muqtadirs envoys were permitted to continue downriver to Jajania. Upon their arrival, the freezing winter swept over Khwarezmia's oasis landscape and froze the Oxus River solid, halting Ibn Fadlan and his companions for the foreseeable future. They would have to wait out the storm where they were. Our narrator vividly describes the biting cold, with Jajania's empty markets and streets, men freezing to death after going to fetch firewood, massive ancient trees split apart by the cold, and quite comically, his own beard freezing. Three full months later, 
In mid-February of 922, Winter's grasp began to loosen and the river thawed. As markets livened up again, the embassy purchased some camels, provisions of bread, millet and cured meat, and made sure to buy thick winter clothing. The locals had advised them of the terrifying cold they would encounter further north, and the description convinced many of the expedition to go back home, while more enterprising travellers, including Ibn Fadlan, entered the so-called Realm of the Turks. The Muslims were truly in foreign climes now. Now travelling by camel through barren mountainless desert, the chill and snowstorms began to truly affect the party, with many of the pagan Turkic retainers asking what God wanted from them to make him strike the party with such weather. After several weeks of tired travelling, the embassy, travelling in a caravan 3,000 mounts and 5,000 men in number, crossed a mountain and reached the alien lands of the Guzia, also known as the Oghuz Turks, ancestors of the Seljuks. To the Muslims' shock, these were nomads with a very different way of life, who, according to Ibn Fadlan, led wretched lives, lacked any kind of cleanliness, and wore their clothes to rags. During the trip, the Turks had a habit of halting the caravan and refusing any further passage until plied with gifts, such as flatbread, fancy kaftans from Jojania, raisins and nuts. Eventually, Fadlan and company came to the camp belonging to Atrak, an Oghuz chief, to whom gifts were given in return for conversion to Islam. Atrak was also apparently a talented horseman and archer, who Ibn Fadlan witnessed shooting a goose out of the sky with an arrow at full gallop. One day, this chief summoned his regional counterparts to discuss the embassy's passage, but they feared the caliph's men were being sent to mobilize the Khazars against them. A few even suggested killing the party or ransoming them for prisoners, but in the end al-Muqtadir's men were allowed to go on. To the north were even more hostile steppe lands, containing many rivers and nomadic tribes with even stranger cultures. First, the party of emissaries spent a day with the Bajanak, a brown-skinned, shaved people who lived in miserable poverty even compared to the Oghuz who lived nearer to the Islamic world. In English, we know this tribe as the Pechenegs, reportedly the most fearsome nomads of the age. After bidding farewell to these rough barbarians, the Muslim caravan had to cross the Jaik River, largest and fiercest of all the rivers the group had come across, according to our chronicler. It was a dangerous crossing they had to make, and Ibn Fadlan saw one of the floating rafts dramatically capsize into the swirling torrent, all its passengers and animals drowning or being swept away. With a heavy heart at the losses, the survivors moved on. Beyond the river was the land of a tribe known as the Bashkirid, likely the people we know as Magyars, whose warriors took no prisoners, ate lice and worshipped cranes, snakes and other animals. Duly horrified by this, the caravan moved on from Bashkirt lands and crossed a few smaller rivers before it finally neared the realm of Almish. When the exhausted travellers were a day's march away, Four vassal Bulgar chiefs and a number of royal relatives were sent out to welcome the Caliph's embassy with food and to escort them safely. During the next day, ten miles from Almish's encampment, the king himself rode up with his personal retainers to bring them the rest of the way. Ibn Fadlan looked at Almish and saw a good-looking man who inspired respect, yet one who was a bit overweight. He was king after all. Quite humorously, the journey storyteller said that he was like a big speaking barrel. After traveling 70 days from Jojania in some of the most hostile conditions imaginable and ones that Arabs were unfamiliar with, Ibn Fadlan's party arrived on May 12, 922 and immediately went to rest in the yurts that had been provided for them by their host. Al-Muqtadir's men would recover from their long journey for four full days while Almish's prime vassals, military leaders and prominent tribesmen arrived. This gave Ibn Fadlan time to explore and experience some things which for him must have been truly stunning. On his first night, Ibn Fadlan witnessed the horizon turning a colourful shade of red and heard a great noise from the sky. Upon turning to look, he supposedly saw majestic spectral soldiers holding lances and swords charging each other in the sky. 
As these armies of light clashed, Ibn Fadlan and the Muslims with him began to pray in fear, and the local Bulgars began to laugh at them, explaining that the armies were of believing and unbelieving jinn who fight every evening. In reality, he had probably just seen the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. When all notable figures arrived, they all gathered in Almish's tent, supposedly large enough to hold 1,000 people. The Muslim representatives unfurled two large black Abbasid banners, and Ibn Fadlan stepped forward before the king on his Byzantine silk-clad throne, preparing to read his master's letter. Before he did so, however, the emissary boldly commanded Almish and his seated commanders to stand as a mark of respect for the caliph, and bowing to his patron's majesty, they did so. Ibn Fadlan, standing on one of the royal tent's many Armenian rugs, began to read from the letter, the Bulgar king and his men looking on with interest. We don't actually know its contents word for word, but upon its conclusion, Almish shouted Allahu Akbar so loudly that the ground shook, indicating that he was happy with the state of affairs. Now that the formal reading ceremony was concluded, Ibn Fadlan presented the standard gifts to Elmish, including aromas, fine cloth, pearls, and a robe of honor for his wife. With this done, most people dispersed, while Ibn Fadlan was invited to a formal banquet. After such a long and successful day, our chronicler could probably have slept with satisfaction, but the trials weren't over just yet. The king might have been promised money, but it still hadn't arrived. Three days after the letter reading, Almish impatiently summoned Ibn Fadlan to a private audience, and he seemed in a far more angry mood. The Bulgar king had heard whispers that the money he had been promised had not arrived with the embassy, and demanded Fadlan explain why. Somewhat unnerved by the king's anger, the Arab emissary beseeched the Bulgar to understand that it had been impossible to collect the money in time to make the journey, and left it to be brought later. Almish wasn't impressed and almost in disbelief, replied that one of the only reasons the embassy had come in the first place was to give him this money, so that his people could be protected from the Khazars. Because al muqtadir had trusted Ibn Fadlan to read the letter and listen to Almish's answer, it was to Ibn Fadlan that the Bulgar king looked for recompense. He would accept money from nobody else but him. The emissary left Almish's presence in an upset mood. Almish was a respectable man, and Ibn Fadlan didn't want to be on his bad side. Despite being understandably angry for a while about this, the Bulgar king seems to have come to terms with the state of affairs after much persuasion, and eventually trusted his Arab friend again. As Elmish packed up his nomadic camp and prepared to move elsewhere after the summer solstice, Ibn Fadlan travelled with him, but seems to have lagged behind a bit to take in the local scenery and cultures. He learned of the Bulgars' lateral succession and inheritance practices, the brutal justice system in which most crimes were punished with death, a custom of sacrificing intelligent people so they can serve God, taboos against urinating whilst armed, and mixed male and female bathing, all of which seemed to both intrigue and revolt the Muslims. In a more heartwarming encounter, Ibn Fadlan came upon a tribal group numbering 5,000 men, women and children who had converted to Islam and constructed a humble wooden mosque to pray in. While this made the Arabs smile, the nomads were unfamiliar with correct prayer practices and did not know how to read the Quran, leading the Islamic law expert to teach them. One man in this kin group, known as Talut, even converted in Ibn Fadlan's presence saying that he wished to take Ibn Fadlan's name as his own in gratitude for the foreigner teaching his people. Afterwards, the man's wife, mother and children were also converted. Likely with a smile on his face, our chronicler tells us that upon his departure, Talut was happier than if he had been made king of the Bulgars. The Muslims eventually caught up with Almish and his nomadic court at a place near three lakes close to the Volga River. Here they supposedly saw giants, witnessed local steppe politics and even some rhinoceroses, after which Almish and Ibn Fadlan had one final conversation. Possibly while the pair were riding along on horses, the Arab asked why Almish had asked for the Caliph's money in the first place, having now witnessed the surprising prosperity of Volga Bulgaria. 
Your kingdom is vast, you have great wealth, the taxes you raise are considerable, Fadlan stated. So why did you ask the Caliph to build you a castle from his own admittedly unlimited funds? The Bulgar king replied that he had sent the request because he knew al muqtadirs money would have been obtained lawfully and that any fort constructed with it would bring blessings. At that point, we believe that Almish and the Abbasid embassy parted company, as we do not see him again in our account. The Bulgars probably went to their sheltered winter pastures, while Ibn Fadlan went to the Volga River and came upon another curious people we know as the Rus Vikings. A mercantile and stereotypically savage people in the early 10th century, the Rus encountered by Ibn Fadlan had come in their long sailing ships down the Volga River in order to trade and had set up an encampment to do so. The first notable thing he notes about the Rus is their fantastic physique. These Vikings were tall like palm trees, fair-skinned, fair-haired, and healthy in color. They did not wear coats or kaftans like Muslims, but simple cloaks, which cover one side of the body but leaves one hand free. Each Rus man is absolutely armed to the teeth, possessing an axe, a broad-bladed sword, and a knife, which they are never parted from under any circumstances. From toe to neck, each Viking man is tattooed with dark green designs, while the women wear brooches and torques of iron, silver, copper, or gold, depending on their husband's wealth. Despite this, Ibn Fadlan complains about disgusting habits and lack of bathing, in addition to pagan practices in which they prostrate themselves before idols and sacrifice animals to them. These dead animal parts are left out before the idol overnight and are consumed by scavenging dogs or other creatures. When the Rus discover that the offerings have been consumed, they say, my lord is pleased with the food I put out. One day, on the banks of the Volga River, Ibn Fadlan seems to have witnessed the funeral of a great man, an occasion of such foreign brutality that we can barely imagine what the chronicler might have thought of it. When the prominent Viking passed away, members of his family asked his slaves, which one of you will die with him? One of the slave girls replied that she would be the one, and after this, there was no changing of minds. Upon the day of the funeral, Ibn Fadlan went to the river, where the dead man's boat was anchored, and witnessed as the Rus constructed four-posted scaffolding on which the boat was placed. Then, the ship was adorned with a luxurious couch and covered with ornate Byzantine silk blankets and other rich decorations by an old, fat, ugly crone woman known as the Angel of Death. The dead man was then taken from his shallow grave and placed on the couch. This Viking's weapons were placed beside him, and various animals were sacrificed, their flesh to be thrown into the ship with the dead man. At this point, the chosen slave girl began to walk around all of the constructed homes, having sex with each of the prominent man's acquaintances, at which the men say, tell the master that I only did this for your love of him. After bidding farewell to her female companions and conducting some more rituals, the unfortunate woman was taken into another home and gang raped by six men. Her cries are ritually drowned out by the Rus warriors, banging on their shields with staves. This is followed by the girl being forced to lay beside her dead master and is then knifed in the ribs and strangled until she was dead. This was a truly horrific way to die and it marks the most striking moment of Ibn Fadlan's record. And yet it is, sadly and abruptly, also the end of his narrative. We do not know whether or not Almish eventually received his money, we don't know Ibn Fadlan's ultimate fate, or if he ever met up with the Bulgar king who apparently trusted him so much again. The narrative simply ends, but we can hope that there was a happy ending with our great chronicler returning home with grand tales to tell his caliph and a successful alliance concluded. More videos on the ancient travelers are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.